Welcome to this episode of the Animals at Home podcast. Thank you very much for joining me today. As always, if you're enjoying the show, a rating or review on the iTunes Apple podcasting app is always greatly appreciated. If you do want to follow me on Instagram, you can find me at at animals at home ca i try my best to post pictures on there occasionally but of course then that's the way you can stay up to date with the podcast episodes that are being released as well as any youtube videos that i do check out animals at home.ca slash shop to check out the selection of shirts and sweaters that i do have if you do end up picking up one five dollars does get donated to the amazon rainforest conservancy Thank you to our sponsor, CustomReptileHabitats.com. Custom Reptile Habitats is your source for gold standard, sort of top quality reptile care equipment. So definitely go check them out. There are links in the description as well as the show notes. Now on last week's episode, I totally forgot to mention something super exciting that I got to participate in. So about two weeks ago, I was a guest on the From the Ground Up podcast with Joe and Melissa from Port City Pythons. That was a a great time. I really enjoyed myself. We spoke for about two hours. We discussed everything sort of from my intro to the hobby and kind of how I've evolved since then and why I started the podcast and whatnot. And I sort of am able to flesh out my ideas about ethics and philosophy around animal care a little bit more than I normally do. A lot of you guys will already be aware of, of most of that, but if you are interested, definitely go check them out. That was about two weeks ago. You'll find uh, you'll easily find it if you would find them on Instagram or on Facebook or on any of the podcasting apps. So I definitely invite you to go check that out because that was a lot of fun. Okay, on to today's episode. So today I am speaking with Jordan Jones. Now Jordan was a guest on episode number 19 of the Animals at Home podcast, so you probably are already familiar with her. She's also on Instagram with quite a large following at JJ's Reptile World. Now Jordan is one of the 15 plus and sort of the poster child of whistleblowers against the animal sanctuary Wildlife in Need. Wildlife in Need is an animal sanctuary in Indiana and is owned by a man named Tim Stark. Now this wildlife in need originally was established to help rehab native animals and release them back into the wild, and that slowly degraded into more of an exploitation of exotic animals slash prison, and it's hard to describe it. It's, it's one, of those, one of those, you know, horror stories of animals that are just kept in the worst conditions. Animals are dying and diseased and injured, and it's sort of all kept behind the scenes from the public, and we have a few whistleblowers who are stepping up, Jordan being one of them. So she does tell the story of how she started there all the way to where they are now with the sort of legalities of it all. We didn't get into suit tons of really gruesome details. I don't think that's sort of that appropriate. People don't necessarily want to be listening to that. However, she did send me, I think, like 50 plus pictures to include in the show notes. So if you are interested in seeing some of these dire conditions and some of the some of the just horrific things that the volunteers had to put up with on a daily basis, go to the show notes. The show notes are going to be really extensive this episode. I'm going to try to include a bunch of different clips. I'll include the, the news clips as well um, that, that are part of this case. And so Again, we don't get into really gruesome details, although we do get into some things that may be slightly hard for some people to listen to. So I will give a little bit of a warning for those. We do talk about animals' death and, and you know sick and whatnot, but most of the gruesomeness is left for the show notes. So I'll leave that there. And as well, we do talk about a petition at the end of the episode that is in the show notes as well. That's the reason that this episode is being posted essentially 10 days early is because I want to get this out to you guys so we can get as many more signatures as possible on the petition. So I'm going to let the episode roll now, and I'll probably spend a little bit of time at the end of the episode just sort of discussing my thoughts and where we can go from there. Enjoy the show. Well, Jordan, welcome back to the show. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to have you back. Uh, it's, you know, under slightly negative circumstances, although I think that the a lot of times in life we can learn more from the negative circumstances than the positive ones and sort of giving you this chance to really flesh out the whole story, I think will be super helpful to people. So I, I think many people may not be familiar with what we're talking about. And so I think what we can do is just rewind it all the way back to what sort of wildlife in need, what it is and how it got started. I'm not sure how much history you know of, of the actual organization itself. Uh, luckily, I know a good amount. Um, they they kind of, in the beginning, when you first start volunteering, they try to burn it into your brain. That way uh, you have a speech you can tell people whenever they ask you questions. So I know a, a good amount of the property uh, Tim Stark started Wildlife in Need in 1999, and it all started because he was really into wildlife rehabilitation. So he started out with really good intentions and would accept wildlife. He even has a, a falconry, uh, falcon, yeah, falconry um, permit and license, so he can work with uh, with uh, certain birds. And 
it, it started with really good intentions. And then he realized, you know, he, he could um, obtain just exotics of all types. So he eventually got his USDA license, which allowed him to have the tigers and big cats. And uh, he, he somehow got a breeding pair of tigers and they started having babies left and right. And instead of, you know, rehoming them to proper facilities, he was like, oh, well, I can totally just exploit them and make a killing off of this. So that's what started Tiger Baby Playtime. And that started, I don't know an exact date of when it started. It's kind of hazy. Uh, some say it started in like 2011. Uh, some say a little bit sooner than that. Uh, but basically, that's when he started inviting the public. They would pay $25 a ticket and they would sit in a room and he would just surround them with baby tigers and it worked and he was making millions. And so instead of using that money to help build his facility, he was pocketing it and using it to buy himself a new truck, a new siding for his house and even more exotic animals. And obviously it was classified as a nonprofit, I'm sure. Yes, and to this day, it is still classified as a uh, 501c3, but um, there are actually, uh, there's uh, enough evidence um, stating he's embezzling because Wildlife in Need and Tim Stark are two different identities and he's stealing from Wildlife in Need. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, under the law, the corporation itself is a separate thing and is as a nonprofit you can't steal from it even if you are the you know the owner of that that makes right. sense so so he's an individual but before it was open to the public for the the cub or the, the tiger cub playtime was it open to the public could people come in and look at the animals or look at the rehab or was it all sort of closed off and he was just bringing in sick animals and trying to release them uh, so it was closed off uh, he would take some animals and take them out to public places which uh, really upset the community because he would just be at a drive through getting food and he would have a bear in the, in the passenger seat or he'd be walking through a where a warehouse a um just a convenience store with a monkey or you know a fox or something and it would just rally people up and he started trying to charge for pictures so he wouldn't allow people onto the property um he would just try to do the rehabilitation aspect of it. But as he obtained more exotics and big cats, he just started using his rehabilitation patients as food and started just bringing in squirrels, raccoons, skunks, anything injured. And he would just give it to a tiger or a, a big cat. Wow. That is, so. as far as you're aware, it was, like you said, his intentions were, were good at the beginning. It, so he must have had some sort of deep love for animals and he maybe he still does somewhere in there and it just kind of went awry as soon as the money started getting involved. Is that as far as what you think? His love for money trumped his love for animals. Mm. Yeah, I just read there was a really good piece, I think on in December's issue of National Geographic about the issue in the United States with tigers in captivity. And it's amazing how many there are. There's just thousands. There's actually more in captivity than there are in the wild. And, yeah. and the conditions are typically that same scenario where they become this attraction and they're really only valuable as cubs. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest issues that people don't know. That's, that's one of the most common questions uh, people there ask is what happens when they're too old for the show because you can only have them for about 16 weeks um and then the usda cuts it off you can't um you know show them off to the public like that after 16 weeks because they can hurt you but honestly even before the 16 week mark they can still cause a lot of damage and there's been several reports of people being scratched bitten everything i personally have been bitten um, during one of the shows and I had to play it off like it was nothing, but this is a tiger <laughs> and nearly took off my finger. Yeah. Like what is this? How big is a 16 week old tiger? I would say roughly like it's around 30 to 40 pounds depends uh, at that point. They're not on the bottle anymore. Right. Um, so they're, they're eating their meat, things like that. Um, I want to say it's the size of, Oh my goodness. I'm trying to compare it to a dog, but it, <laughs> it's not, 
because they're so thick they're like they're they're not like a dog in that way where they're a dog's almost like more agile a tiger cub yeah. just seems like a tank in a lot of ways yeah i mean that's the best way to put it honestly like they they're about maybe ah oh, this is so difficult i mean <laughs> i want to say a boxer dog mm-hmm. kind of like a boxer i would kind of describe it only thicker and their jaws their bite clamp so in order to remove them we were always taught to push in the cheeks just to get them off of our um whatever they have <laughs> at that time so it's not a good time yeah so so then to to answer those people's questions what did you i mean i, I guess i don't really i mean i assume judging by the article that i had read and assuming you know a lot of these animals do get either put down or they get sold off to horrible places is that that's obviously not what you told the guests but is that what happens to them so we were instructed to say that after the 16 week mark, some stay there. Others are donated to other licensed USDA facilities when that's not the case at all. Uh, yeah, some might stay there. It's very rare. Maybe one or two might stay. Um, but for the most part, they do, they're sold to either other private breeders like himself, um, private owners, or they are sold um, to uh, just private owners in general, they go for a good amount of money. So we have people that live in an apartment that have bought a tiger off of him and the tiger was living in their apartment. And we have pictures of that too. Uh, Luckily, the tiger that we saw um, was uh, confiscated. That that is the weird thing about these tiger laws in the States is that it's actually a lot easier to get one than you might think. And yeah, it is who who is buying these tigers? Is it people that don't know anything about animals? Because I feel like if I had the opportunity to buy a tiger, as much as I love tigers, I would say, hell no. Right, because you're smart. A lot of people <laughs> who have a lot of money, uh, they're just like, you know, I can have anything in the world and I've always wanted a tiger, so let me get a tiger. And they think it's going to act like a cat or a dog and it's a wild animal and they're going to have those instincts naturally. So be prepared. They're going to tear apart your house and probably you too. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's just amazing. And in terms of Tim's facility or his, I guess, yeah, well, it's a, it's sort of a long. It looks from the aerial photos, it's this long property. I'm not sure. Is it quite large when you're on on property, or is it kind of a small, cramped? Um, so it's 16 acres altogether. Um, I do have a picture. I've been I've had to show people because they don't really understand exactly what they're looking at. Um, so. The, the property is set up in two different areas. They actually have a next door neighbor who's right in the middle of it. And they're just there. Like Tim doesn't own that property or anything. They're, that's just where they live. So on um, the main side, about the public sees about 5% of the actual property. Wow. So they don't see what we have seen and that's one of the biggest issues because people will go there and be like well i didn't see any animals abused everything looked really good and healthy and those animals went to him so that means that clearly means he loves them he's not abusing them i'm like well you know you got to see five percent of the property um and they're not going to show you an abused animal they're trying to sell you and manipulate you and you know, create this mirage that everything's good, that if these animals right here that you're seeing are healthy, then all the hundreds of thousands behind us are totally fine and healthy too. So the public doesn't get to see all 16 acres for that reason. Right. So is the 5% roughly, is that, is that sort of like a zoo vibe? Like can people pay an admission and go in and look at the animals that are in their enclosures or is it, is it something else? So it's appointment based. Uh, They used to have a site called Eventbrite where you could purchase tickets online. Uh, However, that has recently been taken down given all the lawsuits that have been going on. And so to kind of hide their profits, they now make you private message them to set up an appointment. Um, Just adds another layer to the sketchiness that is wildlife in need. And they from there, they'll book you. And you have to show up and show them your ID. They typically take a picture of your ID, make sure you check out, and then um, they'll let you into the show. So it is by appointment only. If you just show up, um, they're not open during the week, so you're going to run into a gate. Um, However, if it's a weekend and you show up, the gates will be open. However, your chances of getting into a show kind of slim. Well, actually now, since the lawsuit has been come, uh, has been uh, displayed, I guess you could say, uh, their sales have been very low. 
Good. So sad. Yeah. So if somebody just shows up, they can probably immediately go into a show. So in terms of the shows, are these these are mostly tiger cub based, or like I've seen like monkeys and sloths. He's just bringing different exotic animals out into this sort of strange little room. Well, so it used to be tigers. Uh, he actually lost the lawsuit to PETA, um, and I I always have to make a disclaimer. I'm not affiliated with PETA. People think myself and the whistleblowers were PETA people, and we're not PETA people at all. Uh, but PETA, on their own terms, uh, I want to say last year or the year before, they filed a lawsuit against Tim uh, because he violated the Endangered Species Act. He was declawing the tigers, just declawing. Like, how is that going to benefit the environment? It's not. It's going to no. benefit him because those tigers are a liability, allowing the public to play with them. And he doesn't have insurance. So, you Perfect. know, if someone gets bit, you know, it, it has happened before where someone has been injured during one of the shows and they had a lawsuit happen. So he thought, OK, well, let me declaw them. And so that'll that'll eliminate that issue. Um, so. Uh, and for those people who don't around. realize or don't know, declawing a cat is not just like removing the nail. It's actually cutting off like the tip of the foot, basically, or the tip yeah. of the toe. Yeah, it's ten, horrible. Ten, don't recommend. Don't do that. <laughs> yes, not ideal. Uh, not for a cat, not for a tiger, not for anything. Just don't do that. And especially, especially to an endangered species. So he violated the act and the USDA fined him. Um, then PETA got on him, did the lawsuit. He lost, of course. You can't really justify your actions. And on top of that, he didn't have any more money. And lawyers were dropping him left and right because they were like, dude, we can't save you. You did this. So uh, what that lawsuit did was prevent him from putting tigers in the shows. So that was his big money maker. I mean, he was making millions. So since the tigers weren't in the show anymore, people didn't want to come like they didn't want to. So now it's all about trying to draw people in by primates, otters, lemurs. Um, I even saw porcupines uh, skunks now he's putting in indigenous so he's trying they're coming at sloths that's a good I one i saw the sloths um, yeah everybody wants the sloth so he's using that to you know pull on your heartstrings try to draw you on and uh, to make up for the loss of um, not having the tigers in there right so let's let's go back to your interaction with this initially. So this is obviously a, you were a volunteer there. I don't think you got paid to do that. Right? You were a volunteer. Yeah. So they there were times where like I'd be paid under the table. So like if I went and bought something out of my own pocket, for the most part, they didn't pay me back. But sometimes they would give me cash for it um, just to make up for it. Right. So it, tell me the story about how you initially went to apply to be a volunteer at Wildlife in Need. So it was a new, November of 2015. I, I saw the ad on Facebook because they use Facebook to market themselves. And I, I didn't care really for the tigers. I was really interested in the primates. And so I signed up for a show and I went to it and immediately had this weird, weird vibe about it. And I should have listened, but it's okay. I'm not going to get mad at myself for it. So went into the show, you sit down in this barn. It's a, like, a, it looks kind of like a garage in a way. So you, you sit down in the room and you're in a circle and they do their whole speech. You know, don't, um, don't restrain, don't throw yourselves on them. Don't put your fingers in their mouths. Cause people like to do that. Uh, just their whole speech. And then all the animals came out and, um, I was actually really anxious because the tiger was right there. And I was like, what if this, what if this just decides it doesn't like me? What if it just lunges at me? So overall, like I enjoyed the experience and I learned a good amount. And uh, while I was in line to get a photo done, I was talking to a volunteer there and I asked her if there were any reptiles on the property. And she said, yeah, but nobody messes with them. They're all scared of them. And I was like, okay okay well then i'm gonna put in a, a, an application and i did that night i went home i printed out an application and i put it in the mail the next day and then it, within three days they called me and they asked me to start volunteering and so it was like november 20 something um 2015 is 
when I started volunteering and that's where all the fun began. So at that point, you kind of had this immediate impression that was a bit strange, but you went, went through it anyway. And once you started working there, what your roles and responsibilities, was it just sort of everything or were you mainly focused on these reptiles or, and I guess what condition were they in if people weren't caring for them? So in the beginning for the first like one or two months, uh, I would assist with the shows, with the fundraiser, because that's where they wanted people the most. They didn't really pay attention to animal care all that much. They just wanted people who could be there to greet guests and help them check in and just make them feel welcomed and that everything's okay. So for about one or two months, I was assisting with the shows, being in there, watching the tigers, making sure people weren't being crazy with them, uh, things like that. And then, um, we had a fire happen in January, 2016, and that was the reptile barn and 41 animals died. And that's when, uh, Tim's wife at the time had sent me a text basically saying, cause they all knew I was trying to get into the reptile barn and they were okay with that. They just needed help with the fundraiser. So when that fire happened, she just sent me a text saying, sorry, you don't get to work with them anymore. Cause they all died. Oh my and I was God. like, are you kidding me? <laughs> At the time, so, had you already were you already working in the barn a little bit or you were still trying to work your way towards it? I So some of them had made them, he had moved some of them down to the fundraiser, the show barn. We called it the show barn. So right. a couple of them were already down there. So I got to know a few of them and then I got to go in that barn, uh, I would say less than five times for sure before it had burned down. Uh, so I was familiar with who was in there and um, knew who had died. And, uh, luckily like one, uh, one did get out, one was saved from the barn. And, and so I, I really paid a lot of attention to him. Uh, it was a blue tongue skink and he eventually like a month or two later had passed away due to the, you know, the effects of the fire and just his lungs. And that's mainly when I got made fun of, uh, the mockery happened where, um, it, it turned into a whole, you didn't take care of him as much as I took care of him. And I was like, it's not a competition. Yeah. Like, leave me alone. I'm here twice a week. Um, so that's when like a lot of the bullying was going on, which is people who are old enough to be my grandparents. I'm like, so really weird. guys, really? Come on. So at that point, um, what had happened was since, that barn had burned down, he started rebuilding. So he built a new one, but he decided he didn't want to have the reptiles in there just in case another fire happened since there was so much surrounding it. Uh, so he actually put it on the other side of the property. So I know I, I probably sent you an email with this photo in there uh, where it has one, one side of the photo, then there's a neighbor and then the other side of the property. Uh, so on the other side of the property is where he built the new one. And so that's where I primarily worked from 2016 to my end in 2017. And um, it started out small because he lost pretty much everything in the fire. Uh, there is, he lo okay, so he lost 41 animals. The only reptiles he had left was uh, two iguanas, uh, a couple of aquatic turtles, a skink, and an alligator, a baby alligator. <laughs> so why and, did he have so many reptiles? Like, what was he doing with those? Was that going to be part of the show or? Surprisingly, actually, it's not that surprisingly. Uh, but no, he wasn't planning on putting them in the show because they, they weren't his money makers. He didn't. He just wanted them to have so them. Were they just sort of rescues from around at people's pets and whatnot that he ended up collecting? Is that how that? Uh, he purchased all of them. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> not counting the nine giant cicada tortoises as well. Um, and he left them out until December and I got mad and I had been griping at him for a couple months to put them up. So I drove my car to the back and I loaded up nine tortoises in my car <laughs> and drove them over to the other side of the property to put them in the barn. My goodness. So was there any, was there any sort of conclusion of how the fire started in the barn or was it always just inconclusive? inconclusive it's always been inconclusive uh there's theories you know i think it has everything to do with negligence i think whenever you have that many animals in a barn with a lot of heat sources 
you know, I know back when I was a kid, I accidentally burned a hole in my floor from a heat lamp, you mm -hmm. know? So, you know, when you have all of those heating up uh, supplements, something, something could go wrong. And I know nothing was up to fire code, right. nothing. So I think I personally think it was electric. Um, however, there's theories that it was intentional for insurance money. Um, we did have somebody on the property who was a higher up and he was a firefighter and he had made a comment saying, um, he, <laughs> he said, he made a comment to a volunteer right after the fire happened and said, it's a good thing. They taught me how to start a fire without leaving any, you know, leaving any evidence That's what of how said. it started. Yeah. And we're just like, dude, don't say that. <laughs> wow. And nothing came of it. Like nothing, huh. nothing was done about it. Well, that is unusual. And also, even if, even even if it was accidental, it's still heartbreaking. And I'm sure was that sort of the first moment where you were like, "This is not right. Like something is wrong here." Or was there another moment along the way that that you started to get even sort of trust that initial gut? Well, uh, honestly, it sounds so sad, but the first time, like the major red flag, was actually my first day volunteering. Uh, they had me out there greeting guests, and they were the guests were asking me questions about the animals on display, which consisted of a lion. Uh, some tigers, lioness, things like that. And they were asking me questions like, what are their names? How old are they? How did they get here? And I couldn't answer it. And I asked Tim's wife, I was like, what do you want me to say? And she, and she told me at the time, like she didn't have time to go over it with me and to ask another volunteer. And I was like, don't put me out there if I don't know what I'm doing. It doesn't right. make you guys look good and it doesn't make me look good. So that was after I left that day, I almost didn't come back, but I was like, no, there's some lizards in here. There, there's <laughs> some the scales. Lizards. I got to get to the lizards, man. So I was like, I just stick it out and just see how it goes. And it went. Well, I mean, in some ways, it's good that you stayed because obviously what we'll talk about soon is sort of the kind of the downfall or the hopeful downfall of this entire establishment. Um, I think, that, was there also a large water monitor that was part of this whole thing? Because I, I seem to remember seeing some things about this and was that, was that maybe you can talk about that if that was part of this. I, for, I forget if it was. Yeah, um, it it's a bunch of like, they're all connected in mm -hmm. a way. So I'm sorry if I go off track here for a second. Oh sec. no, go, go ahead. So there was a giant Asian water monitor. He's about seven and a half feet long, roughly 70 to 80 pounds. And his name was Goliath. And the day Tim brought him, I was there and he just handed him over to me. And when I say handed, I mean, he just like did this and Bear I hug. was ready. I was ready for him. Um, and I knew that day that I got him, I was like, this is mine. This is my baby. I don't care what anybody says. Um, and so I was his primary caretaker. I, I was there twice a week typically always on a Monday and then either on a Friday or a Saturday, um, walk in, say hello to him, make sure he was fed, make sure he got his baths. Um, we did all kinds of stuff together. He was my best lizard friend. And, um, whenever I had quit in 2017, two weeks later, I was interviewed by fish and wildlife in the USDA. And I was telling them everything that I witnessed. I gave them my evidence, everything like that. And, the officer told me that, you know, if I just stayed off the internet about it, didn't try to go public, uh, that, you know, the day that the animals are confiscated, he will try to get Goliath back to me. So I was like, okay, you won't hear a peep out of me. So I stayed quiet the whole time. Uh, I still presented evidence if I had it, or if I had gotten somebody who had come forward, I would send them over to the officer's things like that. Yeah, at and this then, time, you were no longer volunteering. You were just kind of fed up. You left and you were starting to bring evidence to the government to say this is messed up. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was it, it was time and they told me that basically Tim didn't want anybody in that barn anymore. And I said, why? And they couldn't give me an answer as to why. And I was like, well, maybe you're talking about everybody else. You're not talking to me, right? They're like, no everybody that means you too and i was like well i'm not going to be doing anything else on the property just so you know so i'm resigning at that point point." and they just didn't say anything and i was like that's fine don't say anything i don't i don't care it's not gonna work anyway so 
uh, then it was last year. It was over the summer. It was August or September of 2019. Um, and Jeff Lowe was involved in this situation. And Jeff Lowe owns a similar property only in Oklahoma. And basically Tim signed his animal rights over to Jeff Lowe thinking that if the animals were under a different person's name, they could do tiger baby playtime again and they could make that money. So it was a way to try to get around the lawsuit. Uh, so he started transporting animals and he started transporting animals in November or December of 2018. And he started, he had like this box truck and he would just load up animals and drive from Indiana to Oklahoma. And I looked it up in the GPS uh, from his property to the property in Oklahoma and without stopping or anything, it's 11 hours. So when you add having to stop bathroom breaks, food breaks, sleep breaks, you know, you're talking almost 15, 20 hours on the road. So, uh, Jeff Lowe got mad at Tim Stark and started just blasting him on the internet, just exposing him. And um, that's when he said that the majority of the animals that had showed up on the property were actually, they showed up dead, that they hemorrhaged. So then I reached out to Jeff and I was trying to get him to talk, but he, he didn't want to talk to any of Tim's former uh, staff members. He was trying to stay out of it, even though he was in the middle of it. So he didn't want to talk, but I had confirmation from a, a former employee who had personally loaded Goliath up in the back of the truck. And there's, yeah. So that's, that's how I, I found out that uh, Goliath was transported to Oklahoma and had hemorrhaged uh, because Tim did not provide any heat, food or water. And so uh, Goliath, as well as, like 20 plus other animals of different types, uh, they all hemorrhaged and ended up passing away. And so, so by hemorrhaged, it, like an like sort of organ failure type thing, or yeah, so it's a mixture of like hypothermia and, and uh, hemorrhage, hemorrhaging. So basically, your body slowly shuts down and then you begin to seize and basically um, vomit all of your internal organs. So it's it's slow and it's painful and it happened to Goliath. So what was the, what was the feud between Jeff and, and Tim? Obviously they must've had some kind of agreement and then it went awry along the way. Yeah. Um, this one's kind of a gray area because he's, Jeff isn't really talking as much anymore. Um, however, something had happened. Oh, okay. I know what it was. So Tim transported animals to Oklahoma. They were going to start a new wildlife place and do their little tiger babies and things like that. Uh, well, PETA chimed back in and was like, no, you still can't do it. Doesn't matter whose name it's under. Those cats are not allowed to leave Indiana. And so that played a major role into it. And then Jeff witnessed, you know, the animals showing up and Jeff actually went to the property in July of 2019 and saw it for himself and took photos and realized this wasn't a man he wanted to work with. So he terminated their contract. And now there's a whole lawsuit between him and, and Stark. Oh my gosh. It's such a rat's nest. Yeah. A dude has about five to six lawsuits against him. It's great. <laughs> that is insane. So, well, anyway, I'm sorry to hear about Goliath because I know that I know you took that really hard, and and that's yeah. that, that's a really sad situation as well. And it, it obviously that must have lit some fire under you to do something about this. At this point, you're already starting the whistleblowing process, but did this yeah. take it to another level? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The only reason I stayed quiet was because I thought Fish and Wildlife were were going to give them back to me. And after finding out, you know, he had passed away, I was like, what's the point of being quiet anymore? And I, I took it very personal because everyone to this day, even if they're there or not on that property, they knew that was my baby. That was, that was my kid. So after that, I was like, you know what? I don't care. <laughs> I'm just, I'm going to tell everybody what's going on. And I made a Facebook post back in September and it actually went viral and I was terrified. I didn't know how exactly people were going to respond. I didn't know if I was going to get hate or anything. And honestly, I got 
97% positive. I barely had any hate and anybody who was hating is because they were a Stark supporter and they, he would never do that. So I was like, okay, I take your opinion with a grain of salt. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So at that time, were you the only one stepping forward with this information? Like I do remember the social media posts originally, but there are other whistleblowers at this point, but was it just you at that time? At that time, like for that day or two, it was. And then some of the other girls chimed in um, because we were always taught, don't talk to the media, don't talk to USDA, don't talk to Fish and Wildlife. They're bad. They're going to take away the animals. They're going to euthanize them, everything. So we were already brainwashed to think that we can't talk about this. Uh, So whenever I made that big move and it went viral and it was positive that kind of gave encouragement to everybody else to start sharing their experiences and then we all met up and uh we all had like our our evidence and our documents and we started comparing notes and it was i mean we were there for five hours so it was a very emotional time and and I learned things I didn't know were going on because I was so on the other side of the property. I didn't know everything that the girls were going through. Um, And I learned a lot. I learned about animals that had died recently. I had learned about incidents Tim had done. um, And we just compared notes and we were like, you know what? We got to do something about it. And that's when I started contacting reporters. So how did you guys go about that? You just started sort of blasting out to new local news and and seeing if someone would pick up the story. Yeah. So the, the girls were scared. Uh, I hate, I I was so pissed. I was like, you know what? Stay back. I got it. Let me, I'll be the face. I don't care because he can't touch me. So I started contacting every single news station in my area, every single newspaper, uh, the dodo, because do- the dodo has actually done a story not only on me, but they've done a story on him as well. So I was like, oh, they're going to love this. Uh, and the only news station that got back to me was WHAS 11. And we started uh, sending in evidence in October. And um, it's all part of the brainwashing. We were we were all, I was still scared to talk to them. I was like, oh my God, is this the right thing to do? I was taught not to do this. Like, what's going to happen to me? Are people going to come after me? And I was like, ah, nope, no one's going to do anything. Everything's fine. Just do it. And um, I told the girls, I was like, here, talk to this reporter. They were like, you go first. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I went first. I did the interview. I told them my experience with it. I was like, do it, you guys. And then one by one, they all started doing it. And some, some did not, uh, we have whistleblowers. There's some that are public about it and there's some who are very quiet. There's some that are, um, they had just recently left or we have some that might still currently be there. Uh, so we have, there's about 15 of us, but only about seven or eight of our names are exposed. So it's, it's a fun game because Tim doesn't know who exactly it is. And he right. thinks like, he clearly knows it's me. Um, and he knows a couple of others, but he doesn't realize exactly what's going on and that he's getting a hit from dates backing to 2013 to 2000 actually today. <laughs> so wow. he has no idea what's going on. So in terms of evidence that you guys have, obviously it's notes and memories and whatnot, but do you have pictures and and video and whatnot as well? Oh yeah. So we have a lot of pictures. We have a lot of videos. Um, One of the pictures, it it didn't make it to the news because it was too vulgar, I guess you could say. It was too inappropriate, Uh, but it was this dead lizard that was flipped upside down. And I think I sent that picture to you. Um, and that was a picture I personally took that I witnessed. I, I witnessed the whole thing with it and, um, it, it's not something I would ever want anybody to see or go through the experiences that we all have. I would never wish anybody to go through it because I, I can still remember every single thing that happened and I've been gone since 2017, you know, and it's not stuff I'm ever going to forget it's going to haunt me. And that that's the price I have to pay, but at least it's being documented. So. Right. Yeah. It's, and obviously the people that work at a place like that are people like yourself. And I, and actually I rem, 
in the, I think it was in the outro of the last episode we did together, I, I, I said how compassionate you are to animals. Like I, I was amazed at how, how much you're willing to go out and sacrifice and, and, and go save animals that are just around you, probably to your, to the sort of negative for your own life, you know, spending money and, and picking up things. So for somebody like you to be in a situation like that, which I imagine probably a lot of the volunteers have the same sort of character that you have. Yeah. I can't imagine how difficult that is. It's, it's definitely emotionally draining. Um, it, it's been a ride since I found out the news in September and some days I just want to stop and just be like, just quit for a second. But I, I don't want to, <laughs> it, I have to keep moving forward until he is incarcerated. And that's just not, that's not just my mission. I mean, that's the other girls as well. And all of the whistleblowers, um, you know, we're, we're tired of letting it continue. And, uh, luckily the girls are also and people who are still there, even if they are against me and the other girls, um, I can honestly say everybody who is there and who have spoken and not spoken, uh, their heart is in the right place. They mean, well, they are there for those animals. I've spoken to some people where we're, we're disagreeing, um, and they don't want to come to terms with it, but we have agreed that, you know, I cared about the animals when I was there. I still do. They care. And so that's why they're still there is to make sure they stay alive. So there's no disrespect in that sense. Um, just because I understand where they're coming from. However, in the majority of the people who are still there, they're restricted from going on to the rest of the property. So they don't get to see what we saw. So they can't see it for themselves because they're too restricted to just doing the fundraiser. So they don't actually know, and they don't want to believe the evidence we have in front of them. Right. So they see the animals that they work with on a daily basis. And for them, they can't leave because they're protecting right. them. Absolutely. So in terms of where you guys are now, obviously there's been a couple, the, the, was it WH? I forget what the- WHAS 11. Yeah. They've done a few stories on it as well. And I, I know now there's a lawsuit opened. So how, how does yeah. that work? Is it, I, 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 it's, it's kind of confusing in terms of the legality of it all. Who, who is suing who? Is the government is suing him? We got a lot of lawsuits going on. So let's start yeah. from the top. Yeah. So we have uh, PETA versus him. And that's something they did on their own. Uh, then you have the attorney general. So it is the state of Indiana that's against them. Uh, the USDA as well. Uh, Jeff Lowe. Uh, there is also, I can't really release any names. Uh, there's also a lawsuit between the person who was attacked by the hyena. Mm, they yes. have a lawsuit against them. And then there's, I don't know too much detail about this one, but there is another one brewing with a different case. Uh, so uh, he needs a lot of money <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because he's got a couple things going against him and if, if he's not going to be incarcerated for animal abuse, he sh should be at least incarcerated for embezzlement and the business aspect of it and tax fraud. Uh, so we're shooting them from a couple different directions intentionally to make sure that justice is served one way or another. Yeah, hopefully one of those sticks. And I think for the hyena stick. one... <laughs> I because I, I had seen something about the hyena one as well. So maybe if I talk about it, I can't say anything accidental because I don't know. But I I think it was on one of the news clips. It it was uh, actually one of yeah. the hyenas bit one of the volunteers yeah. in the arm, and it was like a massive bite. It, this bite looked horrible. Yeah. So uh, we were actually surprised it made it onto the news because all the people who interviewed, including myself, we kind of gave short statements about it. But they went to the DNR, and the DNR just gave it to them. Uh, because it's public record. So, um, yeah, it was an employee there who worked there for years, knew the area, was real good friends with Tim, and I uh, noticed the hyena was out. And the hyena's name is Jelani. Um, There's some people who have pictures of Jelani. Uh, when Jelani, you know, hyenas have a very strong bite. I do believe, I don't know if this is, it's either top 10 or top five strongest bite. I'm not entirely sure on that number. Um, but they're known for that bite. So uh, the gentleman noticed that Jelani was out and uh, there was also a great Dane. There was a dog running around, which was Tim's dog. And uh, Tim was in Oklahoma at the time and his wife at the time was on the property. And so the gentleman was trying to get the hyena back into the enclosure and the dog was trying to get with the hyena. The hyena was trying to 
get after the dog. And it turned into this giant fiasco where the hyena turned on the guy and ripped this part. Yeah. Like right into the inside of the elbow. Yeah. Yeah. Ripped apart uh, some main arteries. And what amazes me is this guy, he, he managed to get Jelani back in the enclosure. Um, He calls Tim's wife at the time tells her and there's like barely any reception on that property. So how he did this, I have no idea. Uh, told her to call an ambulance. Uh, there's a recording of her, uh, doing the nine one one call. Um, and he actually created his own tourniquet with his belt in the process of it. Now, I don't know about you. If I had just gotten bit and I'm losing blood, I would just fall over. I'm useless. Like, there I go. This is how I die. (laughs) So this man just like creates a tourniquet and he was losing consciousness and, his wife was contacted. She, you know, flies over there. Ambulance gets there. And what, what kills me is that the ambulance, the EMTs actually stopped um, when they got there. Instead of treating him, they actually started taking pictures of the animals that were on display. Oh, my um, gosh. Yeah. And I was like, okay, dying man. Cool. Let's, let's take a picture of a lion, though. Like they so, thought the animals were so cool that, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so that was a personal pet peeve. <laughs> so they finally yeah, loaded pet him up. Pet peeve might be an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> so they finally did load him up and they took him to the hospital and immediately took him back to surgery. Now at this point, his wife, um, the, like I said, bad reception. So whenever she got the phone call, she just knew that her husband had been injured, but she didn't know what happened. So she gets to the hospital and um, doesn't hear what happened for at least five to six hours. So she's sitting there freaking out and then she, you know, she talked to him and finally uh, found out, you know, it was Jelani that caused the issue and Tim was contacted and he didn't, he was more concerned to know how they were going to handle it than he was for the guy's uh, safety, health and well-being. So then he started refusing to pay any medical bills or take responsibility. And so that's where the lawsuit comes into play. Right. Yeah. That, uh, Jeez, and it is quite the bite. And I think even in the pictures it shows, there's, you can see the belt tourniquet around his arm. And yeah, and those are pictures like I hadn't even seen and I'm friends with them. <laughs> right. So I was like, oh my God, like you can actually, and the blood everywhere. Like, yeah, those photos we didn't even get to see. Um, so it was kind of interesting how they just grabbed those real quick. <laughs> so how much effect did the news stories have? Did the news stories, is, is that what imp, is that what started the the original lawsuit with the attorney general? Is that how they got a hold of it? So we had actually a couple of us uh, whistleblowers. We had sent in statements with pictures. Uh, mine was about six pages long. Other people had nine pages, 15 pages. So we wrote down our statements and uh, we were in contact with them the whole time. And we had sent those in. So that and then the pressure um Actually, that's not true. It was it was actually all of our statements that caused this lawsuit to happen because the story was supposed to drop on the it was supposed to drop last Sunday, not this past Sunday, but I don't know the date. Uh, it was supposed to drop last Sunday after the Oscars and it was right. supposed to drop at 11 p.m. And instead, I got a phone call on the Thursday from my reporter saying, you're not going to believe this. The USDA just revoked just revoked uh, his license. Uh, You guys did it. You guys won. We're airing the story tonight. And all I could do was cry. I was like, are you serious? Oh my God. Are are you serious? So it was the girls and I who our statements pushed this. And then the reporter who was also kind of harassing them, like, so what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Look at all this evidence. What what are you going to do about it? You know, (laughs) that's when the USDA was like, okay, cool. Let's, let's do this then. So uh, that's what did the big push. And then everyone else just kind of followed. We're like, Oh, keep going, keep going. This is great. (laughs) Yeah. So that's, that is amazing. I mean, that is is a win already, even if we can see how these lawsuits get handled, but clearly it's, it's been a win. And, and the reporter's name, it was a shame. Was it McAllister or? Yeah. It's Shay McAllister. Yeah. She has some guts. She, she actually goes into the compound and she sits down with Tim, which is one of the interesting things about this story is, is we do see his quote unquote, his side to the thing, because he does have, he talks quite a lot on these interviews, especially on YouTube. They have the raw, the raw interviews, which are a a treat in themselves. (laughs) 
<laughs> but we get to sort of see his side and she's right there asking him these really tough questions. Um, yeah. It's very bizarre. It, it, you know, it, he's the definition of a narcissist. So mm -hmm. uh, we were actually really surprised that he had d agreed to an interview. Uh, he's, he doesn't like the media. He thinks the media twist things. And I can see that in a way with some stories, mm -hmm. um, not with this story. So whenever she had told us that uh, he actually agreed to do an interview, I was like, oh, God. Okay, so now he knows. Uh, <laughs> so what's going to happen? And when we actually saw the footage, all we could do was laugh because he, he sabotaged himself. All he has to do is talk. And it proves our point exactly with the type of person he is. Yeah, totally. And I'll, I'll make sure that's all in the show notes for people to go and watch because he 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 does. He kind of digs his own grave as he's talking. He does. And it, it's it, it is really interesting. Narcissist is the only way to put it, really, because he he blames everybody around him. It's like a classic poor leadership thing. It's like you know the only reason the animals were in those conditions is because the employees weren't doing their job, and exactly. most of you guys weren't even really employees. You're volunteers, and and exactly. when you're the leader, it's kind of your everything is your responsibility. And he loads it all onto you guys. And he, it's, it's a really incredible to, to hear him speak. <laughs> it blows. Like I haven't gotten to watch all of the videos just yet. I was going to do little segments later, kind of debunking what he's saying, uh, because the little parts I have seen have just been false. So crazy. And that, that is one of my favorite statements he made was saying how it was our responsibility, but I was there twice a week. I was in school full time and a student full time. I could only be there twice a week and you're not paying me. So how do you expect me to keep up with 80 plus animals twice a week when you also told me that there were other people working in the barn with me uh, whenever I wasn't there when that wasn't the case at all. So it was just me and four other individuals twice a week taking care of over 80 animals. So what do you expect? We're doing our best to keep them alive doing everything we can applying, you know, doing veterinary medicine. That's how I started studying. It was because I had to. <laughs> and so I started teaching myself how to rehab and that's, I, that's not exactly what, you know, the way you're supposed to do it, but I did save a bunch. I got yeah, a out of necessity. Yeah. So I have him to thank for that. Like, thanks for being an idiot because now I'm certified and licensed. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. It, it, like there's nothing weaker than being the leader or the manager of a team and then blaming your team for the failures of the, the, the operation. Like, it's just like the weakest move you can make. And he, he says it so many times in the interview. It's really crazy. And there's another more, um, sort of a point in the interviews i'm not sure if you'd seen that part where she asks if the animals have enrichment in their enclosures oh yeah and the way no. he I, everybody needs to go watch the way he answers it because he he, he does it in, in kind of a brilliant way almost where he he talks in this giant circle where it's like yes of course they have enrichment and he talks for about two minutes without answering the question it's it's really amazing to see and, and of course everybody can see through it and it's almost like he thinks that he's done the job there in terms of answering it successfully yeah, so I, I had to do an interview last Wednesday with Shay, just an updated interview with like our thoughts and opinions on everything. And she told me that he, <laughs> after the interview, he, like the way he presented himself and started talking, like it was as if he was proud of himself. Like he genuinely thought he did a great job. <laughs> yeah. And we're like, you did, you did, buddy. You did so good. Good yeah. job, bud. Yeah, and I mean that that just oozes out of him while he's talking. It, it, the confidence that he has is truly incredible. For the, even the way he's answering the questions is so brutal. And I mean, there's so many other things in those interviews that are just so bizarre. So if you do end up debunking them, I would love to see that because oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things you know, I think what the ground he stands on is that all of you guys are a quote unquote disgruntled employees who are just out to get him. So how do you guys respond to that? Uh, I mean, we're disgruntled. You know, yeah. we're kind of pissed off with how things have been for sure. Right. But none of us, I know in one of his statements, he said that he kicked us off the property, that we were druggies and we were drunks. Yes. Yeah. No. So I know personally, I have never been kicked off the property. Um, I have a screenshot of the day I resigned me saying I was resigning everything like that. So I was never kicked off the property. Um, and then I know he had also made a statement saying how like we had just dropped off. You know, we, we just stopped showing up when that wasn't the case. 
whenever you shut down an area that we're all working in, we're not going to show up because we can't get in there and we're going to let you know. And so I know personally for myself, I have the screenshot me saying, well, I'm not coming back. Um, for the other girls, a lot of them do. They've dug through other documents stating, you know, showing that they had resigned. Uh, there's one saying like, you can come back. It's no big deal. Cause she had to leave due to health reasons. So um, it, it's, it's a cover up. It's something to make him feel better about himself. And it's also a way for him to manipulate the public and make them think, Oh, you know, we were fired. So we're, we're so mad. So we're going to try to take him down. And we were quiet this whole time. And we weren't quiet. We were talking behind his back the entire time trying to formulate a plan. Yeah. And the, I mean, you're volunteers. So you're, it's not like you're fired. And I mean, what would right. you be disgruntled about financially? There's nothing to be mad about. <laughs> exactly. He act like he did such a disservice. And it's like, no, <laughs> the disservice is to the animals. We dealt with the, the emotional abuse because he's extremely, as you can probably tell, he's extremely abusive and very verbally abusive. And we just dealt with it to work with the animals to make sure that they stayed alive and they got to see food, see enrichment, you know, actually have a life worth living. Yeah, it's when you think about it, someone who deeply cares about animals as much as you clearly do, it would it and this is not an insult in any way, but it would almost be easy to manipulate you to do things because how deeply you care for the animals. It's like, you can't turn your back. You're not going to leave your day until you're done, you know, cleaning or feeding and changing waters and whatnot. And he, he knows that. Absolutely. And that's what he does to the public too. That's how he gets you to buy a ticket. He shows you those pictures. He'll do an interview with a cute little animal on his arm and we'll talk about how like you can play with them and your money goes to feeding them, you know? So he, it's not just manipulation against his staff, it's the public in general. Right. Because it, he does still seemingly kind of paint it as a rehab release, uh, yeah. wildlife. And I mean, the, even the title of the business is, is horribly ironic in a way, wildlife in need. And <laughs> we always make the statement saying wildlife in need. Yeah, because they are in need. Yeah, leaving. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so there, there's really no rehab, nothing going on. It's just an exotic sort of... Um, place for these animals to be exploited it's an animal hoarding project it's a little boy who always wanted to own all these animals and now he's had the opportunity to do so it's yeah that's um it is sad so anyway you guys have done an amazing job sort of exposing this and and i know there's also a petition can you maybe is that is that still open to be signed i yeah. signed it so um there is a court date on february 28th um Whenever we had got wind that USDA was not going to confiscate his animals immediately, uh, I decided to create a petition to show the prosecutor that how much the community, the state, the neighbor states, everybody throughout the world wants this man to lose his license and never be able to touch another animal again. And so we created the petition and it has almost 10,000 signatures. So we're leaving the petition open until February 28th just to show the prosecutor, the, the judge, everybody that we don't want him here anymore. Yeah, that's awesome. So I'll have that in the show notes and everybody can go give that a sign and, and hopefully we can collect some more signatures there. Yeah. Is there anything when you think of Tim is, is I'm trying, to, I'm trying to ask, like, do you feel sorry for them or for him or is there anything that you you feel like? you see a decent man in there somewhere or is that just totally gone? I can honestly say in the beginning, uh, it was kind of like that father figure. You really wanted him to say he was proud of you, you know? And so you would do whatever you could to, to get that acceptance and maybe get a thank you, something, just some type of gratitude. Um, and so for a while I was striving for that. That's all I wanted. Um, you know, but then, uh, I had found out he actually had a heart attack, I think back in 2018. And I got kind of scared for him. I was like, oh my God, like, I don't want, I don't wish death upon anybody. And I still, to this day, believe it or not, I don't want him dead. Um, but ever since I found out about Goliath, I don't care. <laughs> I right. really don't. And I know whenever he goes to court, he's going to pull that whole sad story. And he's going to these are my animals and I love them. And do his whole spiel and I'm just not going to have any remorse because if you love your animals, you don't do that. 
you don't, you need to be responsible and you've been far from that. Yeah, it is impossible for, I think, most animal lovers to to imagine what it would be like to exploit animals and not care for them properly. Like just, just, you know, see death and disease and poor care and dirty enclosures and just walk through your, you know, your, your, um, uh, or your compound without having any issues with that. Right. And no vet. No vet. Yeah. That was the other thing. Did you ever see a vet on, on the premises? Never, never saw a vet. Yeah. Uh, there okay. was an incident where a caiman lizard had actually dropped his tail and I started freaking out and I was like, well, this, this is a real big open wound. Let's go get it stitched. And he was like, no, no, we don't need to do that. And he took the caiman lizard out of my hand and dipped its tail in eco earth and was like, that'll create a scab. It's fine. What the? No. I was like, Are you kidding me? And I like soaked the lizard, put betadine, put Neil's porn did my part. I can't stitch it up. I'm not good at that. So yeah. Yeah. That is just, <laughs> wow. It's, it's a, it's a really bizarre situation. You just wonder how somebody gets to that, especially if they started, you know, having a passion for animals to begin with, but I guess it's money and lawsuits. And over time you probably just become a resentful person and you, he's probably found himself in this hole that is going to be impossible to dig himself out of. That's the goal. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for coming in and sharing the story. I, I really hope that we can get this on some ears. And, and I, you know, the sad reality of this is Tim Stark's story is not an uncommon one. There's, there's places like this all over the place that are so similar. Yeah. And it, you guys have been incredibly brave and courageous to come up, especially showing your face and being on the news. And, but the yeah. thing is, it actually worked. Yeah, it, it wasn't like it was a, a waste <laughs> no, of time. Work. <laughs> yeah. So this should be a lesson for everybody that if you see this, if you're in a, as long as you can do this safely, you don't have to just blast it out on social media right away. But you can go talk to like you did at the beginning, talk to USDA and just start going through that process because people, most people don't want to see this. Most people want these types of things to be shut down. And absolutely the system that we live in, the society that we live in has things in check that will allow us to take down places like this. Absolutely. Let's finish on just a slightly more positive note. <laughs> I want to change the subject because it just uh, we'll wrap up real quick here. But I know that you also have a product that we talked about last time, and uh, you're still <laughs> working on Repto Rub. I know. And yeah. uh, maybe, can can you let everybody know where they can find you on social media? You post tons of stuff, and and if they want to get Repto Rub, where can they get that? Yeah, so you can actually get it right off my Instagram, uh, which is JJ's Reptile World. You can also go on my Facebook page, which is the same JJ's Reptile World. I have my Etsy shop link in there, and it'll take you directly to the product. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, of course, if you want to learn more about Reptile Lab, you can go to the, the last episode. We discussed a lot about it. But uh, anyway, thank you very much for sharing. And thank you so much for having the courage to, to speak up about this because it's, it's truly inspirational. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. That brings us to the end of that episode. Jordan, thank you very much for coming on the show and explaining your story and, and letting everybody know sort of from start to finish how this whole thing has developed to this point. But more importantly, thank you for having the courage and the bravery and the confidence to step up and talk about this. I know that it's not a comfortable position to be in. I think I can speak for everybody who listened to that story and say thank you for doing that because we as an animal community, people in the animal community, don't want cases like this to exist. We know they do exist and the only way to get rid of them is having people like you who are able to spearhead these incredibly daunting tasks. So you should be very proud of yourself as well as the rest of the team of the whistleblower. So thank you very much. Now, as I said in the intro, we didn't get into too many gruesome details. We kind of wanted to steer around that. I wanted to make the podcast relatively palatable for most people. However, if you are interested in seeing some of these dire conditions, and, and there's also some happy pictures in there, some great pictures with Jordan and Goliath and whatnot, everything is in the show notes. I, I'll, I am going to link the, the YouTube videos as well as the raw interviews uh, with interviews with Tim, as well as the actual news stories that were edited and the ones that were shown on TV. It is definitely something you want to look into, and please definitely go sign the petition if you're here before February 28th, 2020. That would be fantastic, showing Jordan the support for, for such a brave act is, I think, one of the best things that we can do. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes sort of breaking down my thoughts on this entire situation. Clearly, this is a heartbreaking situation. Wildlife in need is something that should never have happened. It should never have degraded that far. And as I said in the episode, the sad reality of it is that those 
types of sanctuaries, air quotes, exist in other areas as well. It's not a one-off thing. There, there, there are other establishments that are in similar shape. Now, the problem with that is that people who are outside the captive animal industry, so we are, as, as reptile enthusiasts or as pet enthusiasts, we are part of the captive animal industry. We, we are part of a group of people that want the privilege to keep animals captively. Now, that is a privilege, and we have to treat it like one. And the issue with having people like Tim Stark is it infringes on our privilege to do this. Now, you and I would not put Tim in the same category as, the same category as us. Clearly, he's missing on some serious ethical and f- philosophical grounds that we're standing on. People who are listening to this show, as well as myself, have a pretty high level of care, or at least are trying to strive for figuring out how sort of the morals and the ethics around keeping animals captive. Like, yes, we are keeping them captive. Now, what does that mean? What, what do we have to do to make sure that, we, that, that it's something that's not a detriment to the animal? Tim clearly is not doing that. And we wouldn't put him in our category. However, there are people who would put him in our category. Animal rights groups like PETA and other animal rights groups will throw anybody who keeps animals captive in the same bucket, which makes characters like Tim and other establishments that are like that incredibly dangerous for us because we will lose out on our privilege. It sort of infringes on our privilege to keep animals captively. Now, I've discussed so many times the importance of keeping animals captive. The reptile industry does a great job of adding to the scientific literature. We're able to maintain animals in captivity that are endangered in the wild. The, the industry itself gives people purpose. It can allow you to redirect your life in a more positive way, which has a positive effect on the community. I don't need to go into this. I've talked about this all the time, but it, it's important to realize that people like Tim Stark are lumped in with people like us. And the best way to deal with people like that are exactly the way Jordan and the whistleblowers handled it. They're exposing it. They're bringing it down. The goal would be to do that before an animal rights group or a PETA or something like that does it. Because then we can show that people in the captive animal group are actually we actually care about how animals are kept captively. And if we can show responsibility by, sh- by pointing out the people who are doing a terrible job and getting rid of them. Because if we don't do that, if we turn a blind eye, eventually PETA is going to come through and say, hey, wow, this is not good. They're going to wipe out that sanctuary, but then they're also going to try to have a bill pass or something that's not going to allow people to care for a specific species of animal. Now, it just it, it was snowballs like that. Of course, that's a brief summary of something that might take years to develop, but it does happen. We don't want people outside of our group doing our dirty work because the more dirty work we can do, the more, the more structure we can provide, the more responsibility we take over this, you know, giant group of people called captive animal keepers and can make a positive change. And we can show people that we actually should keep these animals. These are the positive reasons for allowing us to keep animals. But stories like Tim Stark's obviously are the easy ones to grab for people like PETA and whatnot. So anyway, I just want to make sure that that as a listener, you understand the difference between PETA jumping in there and, and ex- doing this giant expose on something like that and somebody like Jordan who's in the world, right? She understands the risk of exposing somebody like Tim. And it's exactly what we need to do as people in, in the group. So I, I'm, I'm really proud of the whistleblowers and, and thankful that Jordan sh- shared the story with us. And, and I hope that this is one step towards showing people who are on the outside that we do care about the animals and it is important to us. And we're putting the animals first always. All right, we are at the end of the episode. Definitely go check out customreptilehabitats.com. Link is in the show notes as, this, as well as the YouTube description. You can find anything you need for your reptile there. You can follow me on Instagram at animalsathomeca and check out animalsathome.ca slash shop for a t-shirt or a sweater. I will see you guys next time.